Uh, welcome everyone to our session today. It is so nice to see uh, so many uh, colleagues uh, uh, in that has interested in both organization design and corporate strategy today. Uh, today's session is the third master class uh, on corporate strategy organized by the Corporate Strategy Interest Group. Uh, the first uh, two were uh, organized last year. The first one was on evolution of corporate strategy uh, by Connie Halfat and David Tees. And in the fall, we had the second uh, master class on diversification by Bob Huskisson and Belalan Bilalunga. Uh, you can see the recordings, you can get the slides, you can observe this uh, previous and all the current uh, today's session and all future uh, master classes on, our, uh, on the interest group's website. Today, uh, we are very delighted to have Fanish Pranam as an expert on organization and design for our third master class series. Uh, this series, this uh, session, like all previous uh, master class series, are uh, wonderfully organized by Katie Magelson of London Business School. Uh, professor Fanish Pranam is the Roland Berger uh, Chair Professor of Strategy and Organization Design at uh, INSEAD. Uh, Fanish uh, has already made an enormous amount of impact on the strategy uh, and the strategy organization design intersection. Um, it is uh, his uh, research interests are quite broad and applications are quite broad, but using his words, his research focuses on how organizations work and how we, we make them work better. His research is methodologically, theoretically, and intellectually uh, quite an encompassing, and he really he has really extended our understanding of organizations and their design. Uh, I will post in the show in the chat uh, very shortly a link to his free online organization design course. Where um, and this this uh, as you will see uh, um, today's session is uh, at least in part and based on uh, this course material. Uh, one thing that I would like to mention is uh, because Swanish will be talking about uh, his uh, book on microstructure of organizations. Uh, one, th one thing that uh, you may, uh, some of you may not be familiar, but you should be. He also wrote uh, with uh, Bart Van Este a wonderful book on corporate strategy, which I use in my teaching as well. Uh, so he is really uh, has contributed quite a lot. Uh, to our fields and including corporate strategy and organization design and intersection. Uh, with that, uh, Fanish, thank you for being with us. Uh, today's session, we will have the first 40 minutes, uh, 40 minutes of uh, today's session uh, on Fanish. Fanish will be telling, uh, giving us reflections about organization design, his uh, reflections on it. And then we will spend um, the last 20 minutes exclusively on the Q&A. Um, please uh, keep your microphone muted, as Ryan mentioned, in, uh, as Fanish is presenting. And please, whenever you have questions, uh, please uh, share them on the chat. Uh, with this, uh, the screen and the microphone are yours, Fanish. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Martin. What a generous and kind introduction. Um, quite undeserved, but thank you. A real pleasure to be here. And as Martin said, our plan is for me to, to talk for roughly about 40 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll try not to make that sound more onerous than it already does to me. And then we'll use the last 20 for Q&A. Uh, please do go along and put your questions in chat as we progress, because I'm going to keep an eye on them occasionally. And if there seem like questions which are primarily clarification, I'll take them as I go along. And the more substantive ones we will pick up during the last 20 minutes, as Metin says. Um, so I want to start by making a very simple observation how we organize and how we get groups of people to accomplish things, how to organize in some sense, uh, is really one of our oldest and most powerful general purpose technologies. Right? There is no other technological innovation that we can produce without knowing how to organize. So it's really a very fundamental technology in, in its own right. And yet it's also one that we don't understand very well. And the reason I say that is if you look at the success rates or conversely failure rates for organizational transformations, for uh, post-merger integration, for setting up strategic alliances, for reorganizations, for uh, building new companies, they tend to be extremely uh, depressing numbers, right? So very often the numbers are in the 50% range. So it's like flipping a coin, but with a very expensive bet attached to it. So that's the state of our knowledge in, in many of these kind of phenomena. 
Uh, why is that? It's not because you know this is uh, a topic that hasn't been attended to by very smart people. The issue is really complexity. So we are dealing with an aggregation of a system that we already think is one of the most complex systems in the world, which is a human brain. And we're looking at social systems, which are aggregations of those brains. And we, with our individual brains and collectively are trying to understand these systems. So of course, it's gonna be hard. The good news I think is that there is grounds for optimism relatively um, in a recent time frame because of some important developments. So what's new? First, I'm going to make the case that we have some new ways of thinking, theory really, which help tame this complexity and perhaps do so in, in a different way than, than it has been attempted in the past. Whether it's a better way or not, time will tell. But what we can offer is a different way of trying to tame this complexity. Uh, we have a lot more data today than we ever had. And in this sense, actually, the pandemic has been a source of uh, indirect blessing because since all work went online, we've now created through digital exhaust possibly the biggest database ever in the history of mankind on how organizations work. So it's really up to us to mine that data and understand better how organizations really work as opposed to how they're depicted to work often on all charts. And finally, I think we, we are living in the age of algorithms and I'm going to touch on that towards the end of today's talk. Uh, and algorithms are playing, I think, a very important role, not just in helping us mine this data, but also in terms of sometimes embodying the organization design itself, right? Think about Uber, what people and individual controllers do now the algorithm does, and there are other examples like that. But increasingly algorithms could be actually co-members of an organization. So some of the most interesting org design questions, I think, going forward are going to be about uh, how to design systems where humans and intelligent algorithms work together to get things done. So that's kind of the broad canvas of, of why I think this is such a super interesting domain and why it's, it's worth uh, thinking hard about, is this the area of research that you want to dedicate a significant portion of your research life to? I have um, five things on my agenda. So I want to start by setting out a few definitions and terminology. I think it's very important that we all agree on, on what we mean. We may not agree on whether the argument is correct, but we should at least agree on what we're trying to say. Uh, I'll move on to introducing what I think of as five key ideas in the field of organization design. I'll then talk about the link to corporate strategy, which Metin already mentioned is an area I've worked in in the past. And we'll close with some fun discussion of applications. And of course, the fifth item is the Q&A that we will then go on to once this is done. So let's begin with some basic definitions and terminology. So if you're talking about organization design, I think it's kind of useful to first agree on what is an organization. And that might not be as easy to define as you might think. Uh, a few years ago, some friends, Marcus Reitzig, Oliver Alexi, and I, we spent some time actually reviewing some of the most influential definitions of what's an organization across our field. And we looked at literally dozens of these definitions. And what we noticed is while there is diversity, there are indeed some common elements of these definitions, which, which can be really helpful in narrowing down what is it we are talking about when we're talking about organizations. So firstly, we are talking about multi-agent, multi-actor systems. I use the word agent and actor interchangeably. Uh, later, we'll explain how these need not be one person. So these could be representative agents who represent an entire subgroup of people, for instance. But it is really a multi-actor system we are talking about. It has to have identifiable boundaries so we know where the system begins and ends. That doesn't mean the boundaries are impermeable. There can be change. And in fact, the membership need not be stable. So that's not a requirement. Stability is not a requirement. Uh, some kind of existence of system level goals. And this could be unknown to the agents themselves. But from the stance of the observer, you should be able to detect some kind of system level goal towards which the agent's efforts then contribute in some form. Okay, And I'm, I, I want to take pains to emphasize the point that it is not a requirement in these definitions, in any of these definitions we saw, that the individuals in the system know and understand they are in an organization or even understand fully what the goal of the system is. So there are what we think of as implicit organizations. So for instance, think about communities of practice. So these emerge and act like organizations without necessarily attaining great clarity either on what the overall goal of the system is, or, or even of the agents actually being aware they are living and working in an organization. So pretty broad definition. Now, organization design research, of course, is not the only branch of research which looks at organizations. It's a particular branch of organization science, I would say, which is focused in on, on a few questions. Firstly, around how organizations work, 
and how to make them work better. So issues of structure, function, performance, these are really central to uh, the organization design take on, on, on the problem of organization science. Um, I am at pains also to use the term organization science rather than organization theory, which is also a common word we, we often use. Um, that's partly because I share with the, the late John Freeman this little annoyance with the term organization theory. I've never understood like which theory, there's so many, and also why theory, most of the work is empirical. So the term hasn't really kind of struck any deep roots in my mind. Uh, I think it's legitimate to describe what we're doing as an attempt to build a science of organization and organization science perhaps is the umbrella term. There are other branches to it of which org design research is just one. So of course, organizational ecology, institutional theory, resource dependence theory, inter-organizational networks research. These are all subfields, if you like, of organization science. But design research has this very unique uh, perspective, I think, on asking how things work and how to make them work better. So that normative stance, I think, is a very central element of organizational design research. So I want to move on to thinking about some of the core ideas in, in organizational design research. Uh, I want to be quite transparent and, and make clear, I'm giving you the core ideas from a particular perspective on organizational design. Okay, And this is not the only one out there. There are several uh, excellent alternative ways of looking at organizational design research. The perspective I'm going to offer builds on the book that Merton very kindly mentioned earlier, The Microstructure of Organizations. And I think of this as a fourth generation theory of organization design. The first generation being kind of the the immediate uh, aftermath of the industrial revolution and classic thinkers like Fayol and Taylor and others, Mary Parker Follett and others. The second generation is the Carnegie School. And the third generation being what I would call the macrostructural view, which really treated organizations as unitary entities, if not as unitary actors, right? So Miles and Snow, I think, is emblematic of this style of reasoning, where essentially we look at aggregate properties of the system like centralization, formalization, number of layers, and try to relate it to aggregate properties of the environment, right? And what's different, I think, about the fourth generation, which is the microstructural view, is it really thinks about complex organizations as aggregations of simpler organizations. So it has this tendency to look at it like a fractal, where there is a complex system, but within that there are components which can be recursively aggregated up to create the complex system. Uh, this view is not represented only by my students and collaborators. In fact, I think there are many, many scholars with whom I do not co-author or have any direct research relationship with. I would name a few. Uh, Linda Argoti, for instance, Rich Burton, Borg Obel, uh, Nikolai Sigulkov. These are all individuals. Sendil Ethiraj, Felipe Shazar. I think we are all really aligned in our way of thinking about complex organizations in these microstructural terms. And the book that I wrote about this is really a a summary statement of the work that I did, which is mostly with co-authors, but also a little bit of a reflection on the work of these other scholars, uh, as long as it has these microstructural kind of ideas very much front and center, uh, I have tried to include them in this way of thinking, okay? Uh, there is a free asynchronous online PhD level course on the content in this book, which you can find in this link here. And I believe Metin will uh, put it also in the link for you to access later. So what are these five core ideas here? So first, I've already mentioned this, but I want to reiterate it. An organization is any multi-agent goal-oriented system. So it's a very general way of looking at organizations. So it does not preclude a team or a department or a division or a company or a conglomerate or even a dyad from being considered an organization. As long as it's a multi-actor goal-oriented system, we treat it as an organization. Okay, now, what is the implication of thinking about it in such a general way? In fact, all the other points on this page result from this general way of thinking about organizations. But the first and most important implication to point out is that if you're doing research on any of these topics, whether it's cross-functional teams, group decision-making, post-merger integration, subsidiary collaboration, all the way through to open source communities and disaster relief organizations, this perspective, this perspective suggests that an organization design lens may be helpful. Okay, because at, at their core, all these phenomena I'm listing here tend to be multi-actor goal-oriented systems, which means there will be a design component which will address the question of how they function as an organization. Uh, it's not the only lens you might take to these, there are others as well. But as I'll try to show you, taking a design lens raises a particular set of questions and a particular kind of question about these phenomena. Uh, 
which can often be quite fruitful from a research perspective. In fact, I think I have worked on and published papers on nearly all the phenomena in this list, nearly all, not all. And though the phenomena are so diverse, I think what unites them in my mind is at the core of it, I'm thinking of each of these as organizations and therefore trying to understand how does their design work. Okay? And that's really the core phenomena that's driving, the core approach that's driving a lot of the research in this area. The second idea is that all organizations to exist must have a set of solutions, also known as a design, to certain universal problems of organizing. These are division of labor and integration of effort. So this is a universality idea. Uh, we don't take credit for it. I think Henry Mintzberg already had this argument very clearly in his 1979 book. Burton and Nobel did the same. Uh, we take some credit for breaking it out into a bit more fine-grained detail. So we think of task division and task allocation as division of labor. And we think of the provision of rewards and provision of information as integration of effort. And we do point out that very often, because the solutions to the first four problems are not perfect, they will need to be resolved when they will need to be uh, tweaked and changed when exceptions arise. And very often in human systems, authority plays that role. So authority is a very important way to resolve exceptions, but the exceptions themselves come from imperfect solutions to the first four problems. So this is the idea here that regardless of the sector, the size, the scale and scope of an organization, these problems are universal. The solutions are not. Right? And in fact, we would be out of business if the solutions were universal too. So most of what we do as organizational design people is to find the solutions that are context specific and workable in a particular domain to these universal problems. So the problems are universal, the solutions are not. Right? That's the basic idea behind this, this approach. The third big idea is that while the solutions vary a lot and they aren't universal, they do fall into a few basic types, a few basic buckets, if you like. And the broad buckets that we like to think of these solutions as falling into is uh, structure, in particular, mandated hierarchically defined structures, sorting, who is in and out of the system, and the process of sense making, how people mutually adjust to each other. All three are critical to understand the design of an organization. And I want to make a couple of points here because I think this is a subtle but very important point. If we were to understand the design of organizations just by looking at the structure, I think we are creating significant omitted variables. The reason being, people don't get randomly assigned into structures. There's a lot of mutual selection by organizations and by the people who enter them. So therefore, it shouldn't surprise us in the least that a structure that works well in one organization will not work in another. It's not randomly assigned, right? So sorting is playing a very important role here and is, is sort of a hidden variable that we have to take into account if you want to understand uh, how a design works. Once you have the structure, the constraints on action imposed through authority, once you have the sorting and the people are in the system, there's still a fair amount of mutual adjustment going on. So people adapt to each other and the results of that mutual adaptation often get crystallized in what we call culture, what we call norms. And this is again likely to be very specific to particular organizations and their history and their context. And if we don't take that into account, then again, we are missing an important class of variables and creating an omitted variable. Uh, an analogy might be helpful here. If you think about a game, and feel free to think of whatever is your favorite game. So there are the rules of the game, right? If you take baseball or cricket or basketball, there are the rules of the game which are imposed to some degree hierarchically through authority. There's the question of who's playing, who's in the team, that's the sorting. And there is the mutual adjustment of the players, both to each other within the team, as well as, of course, with their competitors across matches, right? And we cannot get an adequate account of how the system is working without taking all three into account. So the big push here is to say, when thinking about our design, let's not stop at structure. At a minimum, we have to think about sorting and also these mutual adjustment processes, which eventually result in what we call culture. The fourth idea is that while structure is not the only thing on the design palette, it is a very important one and it can take enormously complex forms, right? So we are well beyond the functional divisional matrix hybrid, uh, you know, categorization. There are just so many bewildering varieties of structures out there nowadays that it might be actually helpful to reduce that complexity by realizing that despite that variety, at their core, structures actually come in just a few basic recurring patterns. Okay, uh, what are these recurring patterns? Essentially, there are lateral structures and vertical structures, and there are mixed vertical and lateral structures. 
So if you think about an egalitarian team, then this is something like what you have in mind. If you think about a chain of command, then you're thinking about a structure like that. If you think about a typical uh, supervisor and um, uh, subordinate relationship, then this is the kind of structure you might have in mind. If you're thinking about matrix reporting, then this is the sort of structure you might have in mind. So essentially just by combining these notions of uh, vertical and lateral structures and creating hybrids from them, we get essentially a, a range of possible structures just starting from these four, which can, in my view, be used to explain arbitrarily complex structures. So the way you get to arbitrary complexity from these four is through a couple of different tricks. One is scaling. So to each of these, I can keep adding nodes. The second is recursion. So every time I open one of these boxes, you might find one of these other boxes hiding inside there. So that's the recursion process where you can make the structure more complex, right? And concatenation. I can put these different structures together and create more aggregate complex structures. But the claim is that we can create arbitrarily complex structures just starting with these basic microstructures. So why are these basic microstructures useful? They do a couple of things for us. First, it turns out that these patterns recur in surprisingly different places. So for instance, whether you look at the shop floor or the boardroom, this kind of a pattern is quite common in organizations, right? If you were to look more carefully, you might see this in platforms and ecosystems too. So while the context is very different, there is something universal about this basic pattern of interaction between essentially a mixed vertical and lateral structure. And those universalities are what we can leverage when we move from one context to the other, right? That's really the point of thinking in terms of these reduced simple uh, microstructures. So when we look at a lateral structure, for instance, we immediately know that one of the big challenges here is going to be, how do you get agreement in a peer-to-peer -peer group? Because we know the potential for conflict will increase quadratically with the number of agents in the system. In a vertical structure, you know the core problem is one of information transmission and uh, control loss. So you get a sequential filtering problem. So we know immediately looking at structures like this, that that's the root issue. Uh, and of course, there are other issues such as behavioral response to loss of autonomy and so on. So each of these comes, in my view, with a syndrome of attributes, which is a very useful set of heuristics that you can take with you when you spot them, even if they're occurring in widely different contexts. Does this mean context doesn't matter? No, of course not. It's just a good starting point for hypothesis. And of course, context will matter. And it can matter at least in a couple of different ways. It might change the parameters of how the general processes work, or it might induce new, new processes altogether, right? There might be adjustment to the context that changes the way these systems work. So it's not a claim that these are sufficient. It's just a claim that these are useful as a starting point in thinking about more complex structures. So that's point number four. And then finally, the fifth and final point is that in these pictures I just showed you on structure, it's kind of agnostic to what those arrows are. I just said they're interactions. But we find it very helpful in our work to distinguish interdependence from influence. And we actually think that a fair amount of, of uh, confusion can be mitigated or avoided if you're very clear when we are looking at structure and patterns and saying, are we talking about interdependence? Are we talking about influence? There's a distinction. So interdependence is the idea that the returns to my action can depend on somebody else's actions. Okay, Influence is my ability to get others to change their actions. One can exist without the other. But they're very intimately tied in a principle that we know for a long time, which is the idea of fit. Okay? Fit is perhaps the most central idea in organizational design. Uh, there's a beautiful review article by Rich Burton and Borgo Bell in the Journal of Organization Design. And, and Metin, if I forget, please do remind me, I do want to talk about the journal at some point for this group, because it's a great, great platform for getting engaged with the organization design community. So uh, Rich and Borg wrote a lovely review piece about a couple of years ago on fit. And they make the general point, which, which I'm going to reiterate here, that at the core of all that talk about fit, they're really making really one simple point, which is if there's interdependence between actors, it must be matched by some structure of influence between them. This is it, right? That structure of influence could be a peer-to-peer -peer link of mutual influence, or it could be the fact that both are under shared authority. But all the discussion about various kinds of fit can be boiled down to essentially making this point. So think about fit between an organization and its environment. How does that show up in this picture? Different task environments produce different pressures on an organization to adapt, which mean different divisions of labor, different allocations of tasks. And those, of course, produce structures of interdependence. 
which must then be matched by particular patterns of influence in order to coordinate those interdependencies. The second sense in which we talk about fit is between, say, the formal structure and the informal structure. And this picture again shows you that what we need is some complementarity between these so that jointly they're able to match the interdependence created by the division of labor. So at a super abstract, super granular level, what's really happening is this matching process between the interdependence in the system and between the influence in the system. And getting them matched up is really the principle of fit. I often talk about this as a folk theorem. So a folk theorem is a theorem that is generally agreed to be true, widely known in the community, but nobody can put their finger on the first person who can take credit for it. Right? So it's been around long enough that most people believe this is correct. And I think the evidence is fairly, fairly strong that indeed it is correct once one takes into account these differences between interdependence and influence. Uh, but there's no one single claimant, I think, to the idea. So it's one of these ideas that's become a folk theorem in the field. So to summarize, these are really the, the core five ideas in the microstructural perspective on organizational design. As I've, as I've pointed out, this is not the only perspective on org design. It's the fourth generation theory, which means there were three that came before. But the five central ideas here, I think, cover a good, good chunk of, of what it is that we are doing when we apply this perspective and we look at any org design problem. In particular, what this, this way of thinking helps us do, I think, is adapt what I call an organizational design stance. Okay, By this, I mean, you can look at any system and it doesn't only have to be human systems, right? In fact, one of the earliest citations to my book when, I, when it came out, I was, was quite thrilled to see, came from a group who were designing swarms of robots. Okay, and they still felt that the basic ideas were absolutely applicable to them. And I got in touch with the group and asked them, like, how did they discover this stuff and how did they think it applied? But their point was, you know, essentially this is substrate neutral. What you're talking about is multi-actor goal-oriented systems and a set of drones trying to collectively accomplish something still face the same problem. So I've realized over time that it's not that good or that useful a question to ask, is a system an organization or not? Right. So should we call a three person startup company an organization, but not call a team of five people an organization? These seem like questions of convention. They're not really scientific questions in my view. A better approach is to ask, let's take any system with multiple actors that seems to have a collective goal and say, how much can we understand by treating it as an organization? Okay. And see how far we go with that. So that really amounts to asking what is its design? How does it solve these universal problems of division of labor, integration of effort? Uh, how do the different kinds of design solutions in terms of structure, sorting, and sense making play out in the system? And with that broad perspective, you can actually tackle a number of management and organization and strategy problems, which in the past may not have been thought of as organization design problems. But with this breadth of perspective, I think you can treat them as organization design problems. Not exclusively so. I mean, they are rich phenomena, so each one can probably be interpreted through multiple theoretical lenses. But there is something for organizational designers to say the moment we're talking about any multi-agent goal-oriented system. That's really the, the high-level message of this, this particular style of thinking. Um, let me take a quick look at chat if there's anything that needs. Okay, so Mario is asking the question about near decomposability of modularity. Uh, I do not believe this has to be a universal property because we know there's going to be a lot of variation across systems in the extent to which decomposability obtains. Yeah, so in the limit, there is near decomposability. In the other limit, there is extreme complexity. Uh, I should also refer you to a very nice review uh, on organizational design as a field that was published by John Joseph, uh, Rich Burton, Kanan Srikant, and Oliver Bauman. I think it came out two years ago. And they did a very thorough uh, topic modeling based analysis of papers in organizational design. And one of their conclusions by looking at the literature over the last 20 years is a clear growth towards non decomposability. So our organization systems over time seem to have become more and more non modular rather than more modular. And that has led to a lot of complexity and challenge in terms of managing these systems. So I don't know if that's universal. My point simply is we can't assume near decomposability is universal either. Okay, and I'm aware of Simon's arguments and we can discuss those in some detail, but I'm not convinced that that's a universal problem. Okay, uh, I'll come back to, to this in Q&A with, with great pleasure if necessary. I want to talk a little bit about the links between organizational design and corporate strategy. Uh, and uh, Metin already very kindly mentioned the, the other book project that I had worked on a few years ago, 
And in fact, that came before the microstructure book. And it's, I think, an accurate reflection of how I stumbled into organization design. So I didn't start out studying organizational design. I was a corporate strategy guy and was working on post-merger integration. But at some point, as I was working and researching in this field of corporate strategy, something struck me as being quite important and profound, which is corporate advantage, right? The way in which a, a collection of businesses can be worth more than the sum of the parts, in the end comes from one of two sources, either from selection, you're smart at picking the businesses that go into the portfolio or synergies. Right? And in efficient capital market, selection is off the table. So it's mostly going to come from synergies. So this is really the, the core idea and corporate advantage. And synergies in turn, very often, but not always, require some degree of modification of resources. You don't get synergies just by throwing different resources into a basket and shaking. Right? You need to tweak them. You've got to customize them, link them. There's a lot of human collaboration going on for synergies to actually be realized, which really leads to the implication that uh, organizational redesign is probably one of the most important levers for a CEO to generate corporate advantage, because if it's not going to come from just selection and it requires synergies and synergies require modification and collaboration, that's what org design is all about. So the link between the two, I think, is actually a very deep one. And one, it, it took me some time to realize, but eventually the, the links were very fruitfully, I think, exploited by us in this book. So uh, Metin mentioned he uses this for his teaching. I know other friends do as well perhaps including those who are here. I want to highlight three of the uh, greatest hits or most useful frameworks, I think, from this book and point you to their organizational design roots. So for instance, one of the more useful things I think we did in this book is to develop a typology, which is, we argue, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive of operational synergies, not of financial synergies, but of operational synergies. And if you look at this, this way of partitioning the space of synergy operators, uh, we call this the algebra of synergies. So just like plus, minus, multiply, divide are basic operations. These are basic operators on resources. And the key point of distinction is how much you need to modify the underlying resources. Right? That's what is being picked up on the difference here between the operators on the left and the operators on the right. So on here, you see a lot more modification necessary on the right, less so. And that has implications also for whether the effect shows up on costs or revenues or assets how easy they are to forecast and so on. So as you might imagine, this is a pretty useful way of trying to figure out uh, which company to acquire, which business to enter, whom to partner with, how to plan for post-merger integration, how much to value the company. But it all comes from this recognition that synergies are core to what's going on in corporate advantage and synergies vary in the organizational design challenges they pose. Another idea which I think is uh, in the book, but also is, is in multiple papers we've worked on, and I, I'm quite proud to say this is a result that I think has been replicated by many authors with different data sets unconnected to us. And that's the basic trade-off between collaboration and disruption when you conduct post-merger integration. So the basic idea is you bring different organizations together after a merger. You have to integrate to some extent to realize the benefits of collaboration. But the cost of doing that is the disruption and loss of autonomy. And that trade-off is at the heart of whether a deal will actually work or not. So if you pick a deal where most of the synergies can be unleashed with very little need for integration, it's a very modular kind of synergy, your chances of actually getting past the complexity of post-merger integration go up dramatically. Right? But it may not be the highest magnitude of gain. So that's the trade-off that acquirers are always facing. And again, you can see this is very much an idea that comes from organizational design thinking, but applied to corporate strategy. The last one I'll mention, and you can see the links very obviously here, so we have a framework of thinking about how to design an alliance. And we actually studied a, a bunch of contracts on alliances and joint ventures to inductively look at what are the common elements of these, these alliance uh, agreements. And not surprisingly, perhaps, it turns out that there are these five universal sets of clauses. And they map one-on-one -on -one to the five universal problems of organizing that we talked about. Right? And in retrospect, it makes complete sense. An alliance is a temporary organization even if it's just two companies, it's a multi-actor goal-oriented system. So of course it must be true that to define its design, we need answers to these universal problems of task division, task allocation, uh, motivation, coordination, and exception handling. So again, this is like a, a, a framework in corporate strategy, which owes a lot, I think, to the roots of its thinking in organization design. The last thing I want to do is touch very briefly on a, on a few application areas. Uh, beyond the ones that I mentioned in, in corporate strategy. And some of these are relatively 
new ideas. Some are now established in the sense we've published papers on them. Others have done so as well. Uh, but I, I don't intend to claim this is like the final word on possible applications of these ideas. In fact, far from it. Uh, in fact, I'm going to ask Metin later for some help in thinking about application of org design ideas to, to things like uh, sustainability and CSR and ESGs and so on. But I want to give you a flavor of how an org design stance might help you look at phenomena which can be quite different from each other. So the first of these is um, our work on Asian business groups. So this is a very interesting corporate strategy form has been around for a long time. They tend to be these highly diversified family controlled businesses in very unrelated with, uh, lines of business. Very typically the, the, uh, the structure looks like it's just a hodgepodge of very different businesses and not entirely clear why they even belong in the same system. And one very influential explanation has been that it has to do with institutional voids. So this is Tarun's work making the point that you see these kind of collections in systems where internal capital allocation beats the efficiency of external capital allocation. And I think that's that's absolutely correct. But it does raise this bit of a puzzle that in many economies, even as the capital market efficiency improved, the value of being affiliated to a business group actually increased rather than decreased. Right. So we dug deep into this in the context of the of the Indian uh, con in the in the context of Indian business, Indian business groups. And what we discovered is, is quite interesting. So typically, these structures remind us of the triangular structure I showed you earlier, a typical headquarters and subsidiaries. But in a lot of these Indian business groups, these subsidiaries are also listed. So if you look at it from the perspective of one of these, they actually have dual masters. So they are the, the shareholders in the capital markets. And there's, of course, the internal headquarters of the company. And this dual reporting structure that these, these companies have puts them in a very interesting position where the headquarters can force through synergy operations between the businesses where they exist, but the capital markets kind of create scrutiny and discipline on doing too much of that and harming the interests of individual minority shareholders. So it's a very different governance structure compared to say a traditional G, for example, or, or even a, a traditional holding company where there's a single listing at the top. So it is this hybrid split of ownership between headquarters and the capital markets that creates a, a dual reporting structure, which can be quite um, unique in the kind of effects it produces and the kinds of synergies they go for and so on. So a lot of our tech conglomerates are not like this. They're still much more like a holding company structure. We're thinking about Alphabet or Meta, but it may well be that the next stage of evolution for them looks something like this, right? Essentially the spin off parts of their businesses and there is joint reporting both to the headquarters as well as to, uh, in some sense, accountability to the capital markets. Another class of phenomena where I think org design thinking uh, has been already quite helpful is what we call meta organizations. So these are networks of uh, individuals and firms not bound by formal authority relationships, but which nonetheless act as if they have a system level goal. So things like ecosystems, open source, platform organizations, these are all meta organizations and uh, their design is really illustrating this notion of inter-organizational design. And what I think an org design perspective on platforms and ecosystems and open source communities brings is it asks you these same basic questions. How is task division and task allocation done in these platforms? Okay, And there's a fascinating variety in how it happens. So is it done in a collaborative way? Is it meant to modularize? Is it meant to actually create more dependence? Do you want substitutes? Do you want complements in the portfolio? So a number of my friends are working on this topic. So I, I read their work closely. So Michael Jacobides, Carlos Baldwin, Toby Kretschmer, Asim Kol, um, Melissa Schilling, PK Toe, these guys are doing some amazing work on, on these phenomena. But if you look at what they're talking about, it's documenting these variety of solutions to the same basic problems of division of labor and integration of effort that you see in any organization. Okay, So taking that perspective on a platform or an ecosystem really asks you, how are they solving these core problems of division of labor and integration of effort? Another class of phenomena is uh, non-hierarchical organizations. So these are all companies that have made a name by being flat. Okay, And if you take an org design perspective, of course, the obvious question is, so if you're managing without authority, it must mean people are very good at resolving exceptions peer to peer. So how are they doing that? So one line of attack we've taken is that culture is playing a very important role in allowing these organizations to be flat. So in some work I've done with the former student Ariana Marchetti, we use data from Glassdoor and machine learning methods to try and document the culture of these organizations 
and show that in fact the flatter structures tend to have more cult-like cultures. So that's a straightforward implication of the uh, the links between structure sorting and sense making that I showed you earlier. The last point I'll make, and then I'll stop. Um, I'm I'm very excited nowadays to think about human AI collaboration as an organizational design problem. And the reason I find that there's a lot to do here from a design perspective is, I think we've been rather fixated on the idea of division of labor with specialization. So it's very intuitive that algorithms do certain things better than humans and humans do certain things better than algorithms. So what's more natural than chunking it up, right? And dividing up the work so that the algorithms do what they're good at and we do what we are good at. That's absolutely valuable, but there's nothing intrinsically different about that than between offshoring or outsourcing, or in fact, between the logic of comparative advantage that David Ricardo wrote about 300 years ago and what's going on here. What might be new, I think, is the idea of division of labor without specialization. So suppose we ensemble decisions by humans and algorithms. And right? ensembling is a standard technique in machine learning. You build different models on the same data to maximize diversity, and then you aggregate them using some aggregation rule. What if some of the ensemble voters were humans and some were algorithms? Under what conditions would these beat all human teams and all algorithm teams? That's the question that we find really fascinating and interesting. Uh, we don't have all the answers yet, but these are topics that we're working on. Hopefully you see the common thread across these very different phenomena of treating them as organizations and trying to answer the questions about design. There's a lot more one can do. I think social enterprises, designing for resilience. Uh, if you like the flavor of the month, it's managing in the metaverse, right? So there's a lot more one can uh, attack from this perspective of thinking of it as an org design problem and thinking through those five core ideas that I suggested. Let me stop there and we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanish. It's always a pleasure to get your reflections and it was, it was really great. Uh, before we turn to the questions and please uh, everyone uh, post your questions in the chat, uh, because this is a masterclass, uh, will it be possible for you to elaborate a little bit more on the issue of aggregation? Uh, the microstructure perspective, you know, seeing as an organization as multi-agent systems, uh, make aggregation particularly important from individual, especially large organs all the time. Can you reflect a little bit on the issue of aggregation and there's some open questions, if you will? Absolutely. Um, so let me take an instance, which I think everybody would probably be interested in, which is organizational learning, right? So organizational learning is a phenomenon that's central in management in general, but certainly in corporate strategy as well and strategy in general. You might take a macro structural perspective on it, which is to treat the entity as a black box that learns from feedback. And a lot of the work, even in the Carnegie tradition has been like that. So if you think about behavioral theory of the firm, that book is written very much from this black box perspective. And you can do excellent work with that perspective. The problem is, you know, you can build a good wall without a theory of the brick, but you can't improve its internal structure. So if you actually want to improve how an organization learns, you need to understand how the learning of the components produces learning at the aggregate level, right? So this is where the aggregation perspective becomes super important. So what's happening within the system? Are people learning from each other vicariously? Are they learning in a coupled fashion where the actions of one produce outcomes for the other? Is there belief sharing? Is there knowledge exchange? These are the kind of questions you get when you apply an aggregation perspective as opposed to a black box perspective. So in general, I think for any problem that you're interested in, my my simple thumb rule is ask the difference between looking at that system as a black box versus looking at a system which you open up and see perhaps smaller black boxes inside. Because we can't do this infinitely, right? We've got to stop somewhere. But one level below is usually enough to already produce a lot of insight. So that's the general approach of the aggregation story. Thank you. Uh, before we fully turn uh, to Q&A, uh, one, one more thing, because you asked me to remind you. Uh, one of the things for the audience that uh, you may not follow that, but uh, Fanish uh, also contributes to organization design scholarship in multiple ways. <laughs> uh, and that uh, he is currently the president of uh, organization design community. Uh, the, the organization that, uh, you know, premier organization that puts together organization design scholars and practitioners. Uh, can you talk both about the Journal of Organization Design, Punish, as you kindly put the slide, also about the organization design community for a few minutes? Sure. Um, ODC is a collection of, of scholars and practitioners who are interested in organizational design. If you look at our members, you'll see uh, absolutely stellar 
scholars as well as amazing practitioners. We even have corporate members. We just signed Google and Accenture as our uh, first two premier corporate members. What's different about this compared to other academic fora is we actually rub shoulders with practice on a regular basis. So it's really a fascinating place where you can talk about research and talk about what's going on in practice uh, with a very engaged audience and a very interesting conversation. One of the things ODC does also is publish the Journal of Organizational Design, which has now been around for about 10 years. And in fact, Metin is being coy here. He was the previous editor, chief editor of, of JOD, uh, along with John Joseph, under whose leadership the journal really took off. And we have an amazing variety of formats that we cover in terms of the kinds of articles we publish. Uh, and uh, we are constantly looking for submissions. So please do consider sending your work to Journal of Organizational Design. We promise relatively fast turnaround, and we also promise impact on a group that is really interested in these topics. I think this is what is strong about this journal. Current editors are Brian Wu and Oliver Wong. Is that a good ad, Martin? Does the job? Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Um, you know, uh, we care a lot about Journal of Organization Design, Organization Design community, uh, especially as organization design scholars operating studying at the intersection of the, uh, with the strategy. Thank you. Uh, can we now uh, turn to David? Uh, David, the, can you elaborate on your question to finish? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a minor, minor point. I just struck me as we were going along. So I don't know if you, if you want to address it. It is minor. But I was just thinking that graph you showed, that where does the absorption acquisition fit in there? In that there are huge gains to just assimilating and taking, and it doesn't really matter there's a loss of autonomy. In fact, you want that. The, yes. again, minor, minor point here, but. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate your, your being here as a stalwart in this area. Uh, I, I would see the, the absorption outcome in m &A as being one of the possible optimal solutions to that trade-off. So it arises when exactly as you said, the returns from integration are so large that they dwarf the costs, right? And this is going to be the case, I think, for certain kinds of synergies where really the collaboration effects are super important, okay? It's not a universally right way of integrating as Hesper, Lag and Jemison pointed out. So it's very much contingent on the slopes of those two functions. So how fast does the benefit of integration rise? How fast does the cost of integration rise? And the relative rate of rise is going to determine are you at one end or the other? And absorption is one end. Right and preservation is the other, and in between there are other possibilities. So I think all I'm doing is saying they gave archetypes. I'm giving you a more continuous scale because in reality I think integration tends to be continuous. It's not only archetypes. Uh, Finish. Uh, thank you for uh, your elaboration on this point. Uh, one of the questions that we get uh, from the uh, audience when they're signing up, they were asking about the. Uh, what to, how to think about org design in under uncertainty you know with the COVID everything became uncertainty i know that you are doing doing some work on resilience uh can you reflect on this uh, you know in the COVID era and beyond how organization responds to uncertainty and change uh thank you Martin. That that's a great question so this is really the work of uh, one of our PhD students at NCAD, ekin ilzevan and uh, ekin is really leading the charge on this but what we're trying to do is, if you think about an organization as a complex adaptive system, which is how we usually think about it in the microstructural world, what are the sources of resilience of such a system? And if you go back to Thompson, I think he laid out very clearly the idea that resilience comes from buffering and it comes from adaptation. And that literature has taken these ideas and developed them in great detail with lots of mechanisms under each of these categories of buffering and adaptation. What Ekin and I are trying to push on is the point that actually there are trade-offs between the two. Because at its core, buffering is a mechanism that shields you from having to deal with adverse feedback, which by definition means your ability to adapt to feedback is curtailed. So if you take that in insight and push it further, it turns out that a lot of the recommendations we read about on how to produce resilience are mutually contradictory. So we're trying to unpack those contradictions and say, here are the boundary conditions, here's how it works. So that's still work in progress, but thanks for giving a shout out to that. Uh, if I may, I want to turn the tables actually and ask Metin for you to comment on a question that I saw, but I could not answer because I, I don't have expertise on this. So a very interesting question is, how does org design thinking help us deal with issues like ESG, sustainability, and CSR? So you've been thinking about it for a very long time, I think. At least I've seen your papers going back to 2012, even perhaps on this. 
my prior was it's really a special case of ambidexterity okay so ambidexterity has taught us all about the challenge of working with different business models i think i've revised my view and i know it's more subtle than that but maybe you want to elaborate a bit on how it's different uh, thank you um I think ambidexterity is a related resource stream, but I, I think this uh, this thinking on multiple goals is taking it its own own course. Uh, as many things that we study in in, in managements uh, and also in organizations and like everything, this is a bit of old, a bit of new. The question, uh, in a way that when we talk about the ESG issues or the social enterprise, on the one hand, it is a subset, if you will. Uh, in fact, it is. Uh, restricted set of a multi goals problems. And we know that, you know, the empirical reality is organization deal with multiple goals all the time. And uh, most of the people have been studying. I think what has been uh, becoming a little bit more challenging and visible with this uh, dual purpose organizations or the role of, you know, organization really putting this uh, social and uh, financial objectives at the very top of their hierarchy is uh, beyond the multi, uh, multi-goal multi problem. There's also the involvement of the other stakeholders and the external environment more than uh, trying to balance market share growth and profitability. And that is why some of the most of the, in fact, uh, early work on dual purpose organizational hybrid organization are institutional theories, looking at uh, the challenges from different uh, per- the demands on the organization. I, I think where we are going, uh, the field is going now is trying to uh, unpack the trade-offs uh, in fact, when you think about the way you think, uh, think about the link between uh, how you solve, uh, how you look, how you address multiple goals, Philip SSR uh, has a working paper on that. For example, it pulls the ideas about how to how to look at this, this financial and social goals. One is you only look at one goal, which is only the financial objective, and you keep the uh, social social uh, objectives in mind, and that is what institutional concept calls the uh, mission drift. That's a maximizing view. The other end, you see it only as a constraint. So it's a constraint optimization problem. I forget their label. Social and environment objective becomes like a constraint that you still maximize the, so, you know, uh, the financial one. And in between their strategies going back to March and Simon, um, Sartre and March and so on, this in terms of switching the goals, uh, one focusing on the other, combining, which is closer to the idea of dual purpose uh, organizations and so on. So I think the, the broader issue is Seeing them as a comparatively, uh, as Philippe and Coulter's looking at different ways of um, addressing them within the perspective of organization design. The other thing is within each bucket, what are the pretty specific organization design uh, issues? And when you look at the combining uh, and the hybrid organizations, the biggest issue is trade-offs. And that's an old question, but it is becoming more salient. I think that is now uh, what the most organization design scholars are trying to solve. Sounds great. I see a question from Adrian in chat, which I'll make an attempt to answer. So, so I think w- one of the things that also comes from thinking microstructurally is the realization that our theories give us a menu of mechanisms. They don't necessarily tell us like what is likely to work in a particular context, right? So a lot of what I've been trying to do is convert this style of thinking into very practical applied stuff for my MBA students and exec audiences. And essentially what we tell them is you've got to run A-B tests. Okay. The, the theory can give you some possible mechanisms about what's likely to happen in a given situation, but what will actually happen will be very much a function of the sorting and sense-making context that was happening in your organization before we imposed the structure. And I have no general way of telling you what that is. So we can give you an, a way of designing a, an A-B test that can help you answer the question. So to make it concrete, uh, suppose you had to figure out whether agile teams are a good organizational design for you. Okay. As of now, it seems like the approach is uh, some consultant comes and tells you all our clients are doing it. They're happy. They're not dead yet anyway. And uh, maybe you should adopt as well. And that's what you do. And then you hope that you made the right call. An alternative would be to actually run an A-B test or a randomized controlled trial. We know that's expensive, right? So one of the things we are playing with is the idea of combining gamification with A-B tests. So for a lot of knowledge work, we can actually reproduce what teams do in their normal life's life cycle into an activity that can be done in a few hours, okay? And the analogy is to a wind tunnel. So when you build a new plane, you don't fly it off the runway, right? You build a scale model and you put it in the wind tunnel. So can we create the wind tunnel version of that design and run it in a hackathon format, for instance, in a single day? And that we can do complete with randomization and treatment and control. 
So it gives you some insight into what the design flaws or strengths are likely to be, right? And this comes again, I think, from thinking microstructurally because you're thinking about the aggregation mechanisms in great detail and being open to the idea that the parameters are going to be context specific. We don't know that going in. So I think, I hope that that addresses the point that you're raising, which is it's, it is about optimization, but without an a priori theoretical view of what that optimum is. It says here are the main trade-offs and now the question is, What's going to work in this particular context? That's more or less what I expected you to say. Yes, but uh, I, I, thanks for the clarification. It's, it's it, a lot of very, very interesting and genuinely new stuff here. Thank you. How are we doing on time, Nathan? Sorry, I, I lost. Well, I lost my cursor on my screen. Uh, <laughs> we are. We have for a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe you can reflect on David and Mario's questions about uh, the role of decision rights uh, within your framework. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so decision rights appear in two places, David, in, in in the way we think about this. One is, of course, you can think about the um, it as a particular kind of task. The task being one of monitoring and supervision. So a decision right can also be thought of as a particular class of tasks. The other place it arises is an exception handling. So authority, which is the default in most human systems to deal with exceptions, is intimately uh, based ultimately on some kind of residual decision rights, right? So decision rights feature in both of these, but I think they play different roles in the two. So we, we take a lot of uh, trouble to distinguish between authority, which is a relational construct between people and task allocation, which is a, a relational construct between people and tasks. Right, so I see Carlos is here. So if you think about the kind of matrices that she uses in her thinking and theorizing, task allocation is a mapping, which is a, a bimodal matrix essentially, where you have people on one side and tasks on the other. Whereas authority is a people to people relationship. Okay, and I think often decision rights in the way we've used them in the past conflate these things. So we try to pull this apart by thinking of task allocation as being distinct from the effect of authority on exception handling. Uh, and then Mario has a question on the symbiosis integration. So does it allow for, for uh, uh, a temporal sequencing? Absolutely. So the optimal integration at any point in time, right, uh, could, could be changing over time. So for instance, the, the reason symbiosis works in Haspeslag and Jameson, if you go back to the picture I showed you of the trade-offs, right, between the benefits and costs, what symbiosis really is saying is that over a period of time, the cost of disruption actually falls endogenously because you learn better about the people and the culture and the system. So obviously the optimal at point T0 is not the same as, as it is at T1 because the cost has fallen. So you, went, you may slide out the integration more towards one of the corner solutions. So uh, this is really just an algebraic way of re-describing what they did much more poetically, I think. But this is what's going on, right? Essentially, it's the trade-off between the two. And what's changing over time is the marginal benefit, marginal cost calculation between the two. Thank you, Vanish. Uh, we are now out of time. Uh, we would like to thank everyone for attending the master class uh, with Vanish. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you will be able to uh, watch uh, again if you want to come back. Uh, this master class will discusses on the corporate strategy IGs uh, website. Uh, with that, special thanks to Fanish. Fanish, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me.